Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Renee Green, and um, I'm a current director of ACT and also um, faculty here. And uh, I'd like to welcome you this evening uh, to Cinematic Migrations, um, ACT lecture series on experimenting uh, thinking and form. And um, this is a series uh, which is uh, launched as a two-year project uh, called Cinematic Migrations. We're now beginning the second year of the project. Uh, and um, integral to this launch uh, have been the guests, uh, my guests, uh, uh, John Acumfra and Lena Gopal, uh, who are here. I'm very happy that they were able to come again. Um, it's kind of an amazing uh, opportunity to be able to welcome them from the UK and from uh, all around the world um, because they've been quite busy uh, in um, producing uh, their work in various forms. Uh, <coughs> and um, they have uh, graciously agreed uh, to be guests um, visiting uh, one week each semester, uh, and um, which is huge, uh, as they uh, have a company called Smoking Dogs Films, based in London, and um, are uh, participating in this project, in this experiment. Uh, and so Cinematic Migrations is also a seminar, which will continue and uh, in it, um, the term cinematic migrations is thought of as a kind of, as a very broad umbrella. It's meant to be broad and porous, uh, to be able to enable a number of different uh, ways of perceiving how cinema in the present can be considered in time-based media. Uh, so among our guests uh, will be our next guest, uh, Tarek el Haik. Uh, in uh, later in November, and also Joan Jonas uh, will be concluding uh, as a guest in the series, who's also fa uh, faculty emerita of ACT. Um, tonight, I'm very um, excited uh, because we are um, privy to um, the, f the release of a film. Uh, it's actually the exclusive premiere uh, in this country of um, the film that we're going to see tonight, the Stuart Hall Project. Uh, and um, I just want to mention a few things about our guests. Um, so uh, John Acumfra is a filmmaker and a writer uh, and also OBE. Uh, recently, uh, has he has received um, honorary professorship uh, at the University of Arts uh, and Goldsmith, uh, Goldsmiths University, uh, and also University of the Arts uh, in London. Um, and that was this year, right? Okay, so this is. <laughs> and um, the, the Smoking Dogs has been uh, incredibly productive also within just the past year. And I hear the production is going to continue. Uh, into a new film, uh, which will be focusing on Miles Davis. Uh, and so I'm curious to learn about that. But for the moment, um, I'll just give you a brief history uh, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, John Acumfra, OBE, and Lena Gopal co-founded the seminal film and video group Black Audio Film Collective and the more recent production company Smoking Dogs Films. Their collaborative and long-standing partnership has won them over 35 international awards and over 100 official film festival selections, exploring the many facets of migration, human experience, and political struggle. Their documentaries, feature films, TV productions, videos, and gallery installations challenge and redefine traditional modes of filmmaking. Stuart Hall Project 2012, a film about the cultural theorist and sociologist Stuart Hall, debuted at the Sundance Film Festival in January 2013, this year, and was released this fall in the UK cinemas. The Guardian wrote, 
The film reconsiders culture and identity for those excluded from the circles of power through race, gender, and class. We will explore that further in discussion after the film uh, and interrogate that. Um, their latest film, The March um, 2013, uh, charts uh, the story behind the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, watershed moment in the civil rights movement as told by the people who organized and participated in it. The march premiered on PBS uh, on August 27, 2013, uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary um, of the peaceful demonstration. The Comfort and Gopal's extensive filmography includes The Nine Muses, uh, which was produced in 2010. It was screened here a year ago. Um, Oil Spill, the Exxon Valdez disaster, 2009. Riot, 1999, Martin Luther King, Days of Hope, 1997, and Seven Songs for Malcolm, uh, 1993, and many, many more films uh, not listed here of a variety of kinds. Um, this lecture is presented in collaboration with the MIT Visiting Artist Program, uh, and, sorry, uh, yes, and so uh, I think um, what we will do this evening is um, I'm going to turn the mic over to John and Lena, uh, and then um, uh, we will. I will join again. Uh, we will all uh, join together at the end of the film uh, for a conversation, and then open it up to you. So, um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, folks. Thank you very much for coming. I won't keep you that much longer because uh, the film's quite long, so we'd quite like to get going. Uh, essentially, we came uh, last semester and reported to the group that turned up for our session that over the last three and a half years, we've been involved in a research, archival-based research project on the cultural theorist and public intellectual Stuart Hall and that um, out of that research, three distinct projects have grown. One was a three-screen piece called The Unfinished Conversation, which is now at the Tate and will be at the Tate if you happen to be in London for the next five months. Um, and the second strand of that was a single-screen documentary that I'm going to, or we are going to show you tonight. And essentially, the, the project was fairly straightforward. It, the, 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 the premise was um, to try and figure out what the relationship between narrative and the archival could be. Um, most of what you're about to see really is culled from one institution, mainly the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, and so, in many ways, it's, it's about a period between the 50s and the 80s when television in Europe had a certain vision of itself, felt that it could you know, participate in a debate around the themes that structures a culture. And those themes included you know, questions of equality, nuclear disarmament, you know, poverty, etc., etc. Et I'm not going to say more because you see all of it. So um, have a look at the film. It is quite long, as I said, um, and some of the themes may not be familiar to you if you're not uh, uh, into uh, the arcania of British social history. But have a look. Um, we'll be back for 15 or 20 minutes afterwards, and we can have a, a chat. Okay. Thanks very much. So um, given that we're actually, uh, it's almost 9 o'clock, I think we're going to have a um, short discussion. Um, and, but I wanted to let everyone know that we're continuing tomorrow morning uh, in this same space uh, at 9.30. Uh, uh, the seminar meets in here. We will be screening the march. Uh, and so that's going to take place. And then uh, we'll get into uh, also further discussion and conversations, so if you want to return, you're welcome to do that. But, um, and for the moment, I will take, I'd just like to 
mention a few things and then open this up. Um, and uh, yeah, but um, first of all, uh, yeah, I just um, I mentioned uh, earlier today that I seen the film and uh, was incredibly moved uh, seeing it the first time and then seeing it again now uh, I'm still moved uh, and uh, interested even more uh, in, in, <laughs> in how it was made uh, as well as the different layers that are used in creating the, um, this uh, complex portrait uh, and uh, I mean, it, part of the being moved <laughs> has partly to do with uh, having this like, a shared personal relationship with Stuart Hall and also seeing uh, Stuart as a, a figure uh, through the years. And so um, uh, to see the film is just has been fascinating uh, in terms of being able to see through media archives Stuart Hall represented. And, so, and that's one of the things that I think is really unusual uh, uh, about the film. Uh, and particularly for, um, I can say for myself, I had never seen that footage before. I mean, even though I'm familiar with a lot of the different um, uh, aspects and material, uh, and also through, I mean, having, like knowing Stuart, but uh, in terms of seeing that footage uh, from 1958 uh, and all of those things of that just seeing him uh, through the years was incredibly uh, was very touching uh, as, a, as a student in Oxford and then the, all the documents relating to the new left he as an editor and I mean it sort of picks up the conversation that we started to have that we've been having in these different visits um, and um, I, I, I consider it an ongoing conversation uh, but I was I was curious about um, how you see this in your oeuvre of what you've been making um, as a year ago we saw the nine muses which was also incredibly affecting uh, and then this, uh, uh, an individual person um, with a focus uh, on their trajectory. I don't know if you want to say anything sure. about that. I mean, yeah. um, you want to take uh, the uh, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, just to use that. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I, I, I think for us, the, each project really, it's almost like the first time, you know, I don't, um, I'm not aware of any conscious plan or attempt to, to make things as part of a grand plan. Can you speak a little louder? Sure. I, I'm not aware of us uh, trying to, to formulate a kind of grand narrative in which these bits end up. You know, um, Stuart's a friend, has been for 20 or so years, um, it was clear to us that um, that he's known in chapters, really. So there are people f who know of his work uh, with the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, uh, there are people who know of his latest stuff on Thatcherism, and there are people who got into the work when he started to, to speak about ideology and identity formation and so on. I, all of these interests and enthusiasms for his work are fairly kind of self-contained. Um, and it just seemed to us that there was some value in trying to pull some of this stuff together. Um, partly just to, to just illustrate the longevity and reach of, of the thinking, um, but also just so that people can see the extent to which th there are kind of continuities and discontinuities in his own thinking, you know. Um, so that was, a, that was a grand ambition. But there's something that, you know, um, ties the two together in a way, which is, you know, this interest in the archival. Um, n now, in this particular instance, there, there are a number of people who seem to think that... Um, the archival occupies a supplementary place in relation to 
other forms you know, other, other thinkings, you know, and in Stuart's case, there's, there's very much the idea that, oh, well, there's this guy and he wrote all these books. <laughs> and then occasionally he went on television and said something or did radio. And actually, I think we thought the same pretty much until we started to dig it up. And you realized when you started to pull this material together that the two are cross-fertilizing each other in very complicated ways, you know, and, and the material also problematized not just our, our sense of who he was, but the intellectual history of the country. So that, for instance, um, there's a radio program in 1964, and there's this guy who um, uh, isn't really supposed to be talking about race for another 20 years. <laughs> he doesn't really get to talk about race in the books till the 1980s. And there he is in 1964, worrying about the question of multiculture and what would happen to the second generation. And that immediately suggested something to me that I thought might be worth sharing, which is that far from the you know, um, musings on race being incidental, they were in fact constitutive of this moment of cultural studies. Because of course 1964 is also the year when Stuart and Richard Hoggart set up the Centri Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. You know. So f for him, you can tell but just by that, that actually the question of racial identity was always central to his thinking. It might not necessarily have been privileged or foregrounded by the early work, but it was always there, running pretty much alongside all the other stuff. So that, that, was, that was an important consideration for us, especially given the fact that the archival has mattered for so long in our work. And in this particular instance, it was absolutely critical to see whether by means of just the archival, without any voices from the present saying, oh yes, and when I said this, cut to, you know, whether, whether just resorting to the archival, one could construct a narrative. Now, the thing is, if you couldn't, then a lot of our hopes <laughs> go to the wall, you know. Um, uh, over the years, we've said over and over again how much diasporic identities being uh, identities structured by absences, specifically of tangible monuments, find themselves increasingly brought um, uh, into being almost by the archive. And so if the archive can't have a voice, if it can't speak in a way that's legible, then what it says about diasporic history is pretty serious. <laughs> you know? um, so what might feel like a, a, a simple uh, exercise of splicing bits together became ethically and philosophically a really important project for us. And I'm glad we did it. Because in that sense, I think it connects with some of the other stuff that we've been trying to do. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? I was just going to say that um, I think we probably said this a, li a little bit the last time we were here when, when we talked about the hours and hours and hours that we found of Stuart's um, archival presence sort of broadcast I in both ways on on TV and in, especially on radio, hundreds and hundreds of hours. And for us, that was really important to try and bring all of that together. And we left out so much. I mean, one of the most, that's why it took us so long, wasn't it, John? It just took us years to um, piece that together, to transcribe it, and to begin to find a way through all the diverse topics that he, he was talking about. And that was a revelation to us, you know. So. Um, it, it's quite an enormous archive that which we're still living with at the moment. There's still so much that we could have said and done. You know. That's about it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think one of the things that's most fascinating to me, like looking at this now, the second time, is just and also all of your work is the the whole process of selection uh, from masses of material. Uh, that you have uh, and how that uh, is, has been done. In this case, uh, are the primary sources from the BBC archives? 
and I think that that also, in terms of documents, says quite a lot uh, in the fact that he was actually recorded by the BBC and it was possible to find the material again to actually use. So, uh, yeah. A lot, mm -hmm. of it, a lot of the stuff that the, that the you know, these are, uh, the fact that, that you've got all this stuff together um, it shouldn't give people <laughs> It shouldn't give people the wrong idea. I mean, there's no, there are hundreds of hours that you have to sift through in which he makes occasional appearances, you know. And that role changes depending on, on what the subject is. I mean, like, the, the, sh the surprising thing for us was just how quickly he was taken up as a sort of thinker. You know, because here's this young man who comes to England in 1951. Um, he is British because he's come from a British colony. So the question of his foreignness is really not about nationality. He's, he's British. Um, but I'm still surprised to find that by 1954, um, in programs on ways of teaching literature, he's there. And I'm especially surprised that when the BBC goes looking for the voice that might represent this nascent, emergent political formation, the new left, that the guy they chose is this Jamaican. <laughs> you know, that still surprises me. And it, it tells me quite a few things about the, the nature of race and how it functioned in that part of the world in the 50s. But it also tells you something about the extraordinary capacity of this young man. You know, I mean, I, somebody told me off when I showed it um, in, in Birmingham recently. And then, then they said, well, you know, you make him sound like he's extraordinary. And I said, well, he is. <laughs> he is extraordinary. They don't produce, you know, generations don't produce Stuart Hall's every day, you know, and when you have one, especially, you know, diasporic ones, they, they, you know, you might not necessarily want to celebrate them, but I, I think it's worth people at least knowing <laughs> that they've existed, you know. Um, so, can we go now? <laughs> exactly. No, I just uh, want to open this up just uh, for a couple of minutes, uh, like five minutes. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I would imagine it did. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yes. Are you able to put this together? During, during, during the, the, uh, the process of, of putting this together, did what you wanted to create, did the message change over time as you sort of learned through the archives, or was there a vision that you had uh, on the outset? Never, um, we've, we've never really had, for any of the archival pieces, um, a plan to start off with. We were helped in this particular instance by the fact that um, the initial impetus was a three-screen version of this, which was um, really speaking to a theme of identity, um, and, and in particular, uh, an idea of Stuart Hawes that he's been working over again and again, which is his notion that identities are formed at this intersection between the private and the public, between history and the psychic. Um, and uh, as we worked through that, we realized that that argument, that thesis ended in 1968, because by 1968, he's decided he's black. <laughs> so effectively, we were over. And then we were left with all this stuff, you know, stretching back to, uh, forwards rather, to the noughties. So that immediately suggested to us that there was an unfinished project. But I, I, I just didn't have the strength, and I don't think any of us had the energy to go back to a three screen. But I mean, it's just such hard work, three screens. <laughs> you know, um, Not that a single screen isn't, but a, a three screen makes particularly ambitious claims on the psyche. Um, and I just didn't have the energy for, for a second one. And so the single screen became, by default, you know, the next chapter of, of this dual horse saga. That, that would be the only plan, I think, or 
on that on that. Yeah. Yes, I mean there was just so much material, wasn't there? We, I mean, we spent so many years doing the unfinished conversation, um, which is the free screen piece, which actually is um, free screens times forty six minutes. So that's a lot of hours that we get through there. Um, but once we were left with so much more material, we just needed to... Sorry, I'm probably speaking for several mics now. <laughs> um, and I think for us, making a, a, a feature documentary, which had a different sort of audience, was really important for us to try and work through some of our ideas using different sort of platforms for audiences for distribution. And that was really... This, it's. It, it's, it's a bit of a model that we're trying to develop um, from the Nine Muses, which had um, a, a gallery piece to, and then it became a feature film, to then the, the free screen piece, which is called The Unfinished Conversation, to now the Stuart Hall project. It's, it's the sort of work we're trying to do with Archive and, and trying to, to look at how we can expose the work to different audiences and multi-platforms, really. That's, I don't know how late it is. Uh, first to say thank you. The, the work is just um, wonderful, beautiful, important, and such a transcendental piece for uh, people that follow what uh, Stuart Hall have done and have been so influential. Um, as I was looking at the film, I, I noticed that it's an interesting sort of a juxtaposition of use of the archive, not only of history, and personal history in his own autobiographic, but also in sound and the role of Miles Davis as you narrate the, the, the film. And I wonder if you guys want to talk a little bit about that just a position and what, do you, what are your expectations from us, the viewer, to kind of match the music and such an important figure in, in the music field and such an important figure in social studies. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, very, very, very briefly, um, you know, Miles is one of the glue, um, the things that holds us together. You know, he loves Miles as much as we do. Um, but the idea of Miles came much later on. It's really when I heard the radio program that starts the whole film. There was something he says in it that sort of triggered all sorts of things going. Um, and Stuart says uh, that he was interested in, in how Miles put his finger on his soul. And that immediately became a kind of motif, you know, um, both for assembling the images as well as, you know, um, giving Miles the space to, to be the kind of temporal master, if you like, you know. Through Mars, we, can, we began to, to, to imagine how different events um, put fingers on his soul, literally. So that's, that's the importance of Mars for me. Thank you so much. I just wanted to confirm uh, what you've just said, mm. because it seems to me that the curation of all these images is very jazzy, right? And that it riffs, mm. it riffs, it uses the element of jazz that is riffing or improvising um, that is important to the formation of identity, mm. right? Mm. Um, I like, for example, one image where it seems to riff on Norman Rockwell, right? That mm. image where the guy is walking by Powell 4 p.m., mm. and we get this sort of allusion back to that famous Norman Rockwell painting. So I just want to confirm what you're saying about jazz and its um, way of creating Absolutely. the film. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more question, and then I think we're going to stop for now. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued tomorrow. I just had a very quick question, actually, and it was about the archival work. Were any of those radio programs, or w was he ever on Caribbean Voices? Oh. Yeah, because I, I, I just finished reading Naipaul's uh, biography, and there's a lot of the same sort of 
um, questions of identity that he struggled with, but in a very oppositional way. So, okay, just just, just for anyone who is interested and doesn't know what Caribbean Voices is, Caribbean Voices was a BBC British Broadcasting Corporation radio program made specifically for the Caribbean. So they were made and then broadcast in the Caribbean. And a number of, well, in fact, most of the major Caribbean writers and intellectuals worked on that series. It started, I think, in 51, 52, and run pretty much until the Caribbean became free. Um, Stuart, yes, did start, like Night Paul and Sam Selvan, and I mean, all of them, George Lamine, every single major Caribbean writer based in Britain, and sometimes not based in Britain, worked on it, and he was no exception. I think he went in initially as an assistant and uh, worked his way through. What's interesting for me is that he doesn't stay for very long. Somebody clearly decides by 54 that he's too good <laughs> for overseas broadcasts, and then he, he gets literally migrated very quickly into mainstream BBC stuff. <laughs> so I'm sorry that we can't just keep going on because I have a lot more questions. Um, but um, in any case, um, thank you. Thank you for the film. Thank you for being here. And <laughs>